All right, what is Groovy? Groovy is actually a programming language. It is a separate language, but it's one of a family of languages that has a unique uh, relationship to Java. The idea is that Groovy code compiles to Java bytecodes. So even though you're writing in a different language, when you actually compile the code, it turns into bytecodes that run on the JVM. And this means that it works really easily with Java and works on your existing infrastructure. For example, deployment of Groovy code is exactly the same as deployment of Java code. And as a matter of fact, you can easily mix Groovy and Java together. You just add another jar file to your distribution, and then everything works fine. We'll talk a bit more about that as we go along. Of all the, the languages that compile to the JVM, Groovy is by far the easiest one for Java developers to learn. It has a very Java-like syntax to it. It just simplifies things considerably, and I'll be showing you that as we go along. There are other languages that compile to the JVM that have various degrees of popularity. You may have heard, things, heard of languages like Scala or Clojure or even JRuby for running Ruby code on the JVM. But Groovy was never intended to replace Java. Groovy is intended to supplement Java, to extend it and expand it and make it easier. It also lets us use these modern language features like closures and builders and metaprogramming. Some of these things I'll, I'll talk about. People have said Groovy is what Java would have looked like had it been invented in the 21st century. All right, enough of that. Let's actually run some Groovy. So what I'm doing here is I'm showing you some of the code. I also have available, let's see if that shows up okay. This is Spring Source Tool Suite. It's an Eclipse-based tool. There's a Groovy plugin for Eclipse, but I happen to like Spring Source Tool Suite because it also handles uh, Grails applications very nicely. But I just thought I'd bring that up, and I'm hoping that font is big enough. Actually, now that I think about it, let me make that font one size uh, bigger. So there's the Groovy Hello World program. It's very different from Java, of course. Java, you have to put everything in a class. Java, you have to have a main method in that class if you're going to run an application. Groovy is able to, it does lots of classes too, which we'll look at, but it also does just plain old scripts. So here we see a regular program, a script, and it's using print line, and in fact, that print line is a method. It doesn't look like a method because you don't see any parentheses, but in Groovy, parentheses are optional if it's obvious what's going on. Here they're supplying a string to the print line method. You also don't see any semicolons here. Semicolons are also optional. Now let me just run this just to prove that it does what, I, what I'm saying it, it does. And as soon as I execute it, you see there's our printout of Hello World. Now when you install Groovy, it comes with a nice console that you can use uh, that's graphical and, and helpful and it lets you test out scripts and things like that. Or, as I say, there are a variety of editors. There are modes that are supported in all the major IDEs, like Eclipse here, uh, STS, uh, NetBeans has Groovy support, and I believe uh, many of the core team members use IntelliJ's IDEA, which has excellent Groovy and Grail support. So the bottom line on that little script is, first of all, hey, it's only a script. Now, of course, this has got to run on the JVM, so it does have to get converted to bytecodes. If I took a, the Java P command, which interrogates bytecodes and tries to say what are the classes and what are the methods, you would find that it would take that script and wrap it inside a main method and extend a class in Groovy called script or something like that, and it's all happening under the hood. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, so one of the target audiences for Groovy would be people who do things in scripting languages because this would give you the opportunity to write scripts in Java-like languages and integrate in with Java-like systems if you need to do that. It's all object-oriented and everything. So I mentioned the optional parentheses and the optional semicolons. I also happen to use deliberately this time single-quoted strings. Single quotes uh, are used for strings and double quotes are used for strings as well. There is a difference which we'll see in a moment. So that was the simplest of all possible applications. I mean, by law, I suppose every, every language has to show a Hello World application. Let me look at something a little bit more interesting. Now, this will be a simple one, and then I'll show a more complicated one. Uh, I want to access what these days we would probably call a kind of RESTful web service. I mean, it's not a full web service. You can't add anything, but it's a, it's a read-only web service. And what it is is it's Google Chart. Now, Google Chart has its API. It's located at this URL, and you're able to create a, a URL string where you append data in the parameters, and Google returns a plot of the results. Now I think I have this uh, set up here. Um, 
this is the Google Chart homepage that I was mentioning. And if I go into the Getting Started page, they show the elements of charts. And you can see uh, the first example, of course, is a Hello World example. Now, I echoed this in our slides here. This is an access to Google Chart. Now, of course, this would all be on one line. So you send your request to this URL, chart.apis.google.com slash chart question mark. And the rest of these things are all parameters. So for example, CHS is the size of the chart in pixels. CHD is the data. This is uh, text data in between 0 and 100. CHT here is the type. In this case, I'm asking for a three-dimensional pie chart. And CHL would be the labels. You see labels are separated by a vertical bar. So if you were to actually send this URL to, uh, put, just type it in your browser, basically, this is what you get back. Here's the Hello World example. As a matter of fact, on that documentation page, this chart right here is actually, if you do a view source, they don't embed an image. They actually put in the URL and evaluate it. It's the source, the image, uh, or rather the URL is embedded in the source attribute of an image tag is how that shows. And they have lots of different kinds of charts, you know, various components and uh, tons of uh, different types. So let me do this sort of thing in Groovy just to show you an example of how you could access a remote web service and then do something with the results. So I'm going to start off with a script that starts like this. Now the word def here means that we're declaring a variable, but we're not determining what type it is. We're not committing to a type. It could be a string, could be a float, could be a double, could be uh, the return value of a method. It could be anything. It means define, but we are going with what, we're, what they call in Groovy optional typing. So we don't have to pick a data type. We can if we want. Groovy has optional typing. If I say string base, that's fine too. Uh, but if you don't care or you don't, you're not sure what you want to do with it yet, then you generally start off with def. So here what I've done is I've put the URL for Google Chart inside single quotes. So this is essentially a string. If I was to ask the base variable, what type are you pointing to, it would say it's a string right now. Now here, I want to send those parameters. I want to append onto that URL you know, a, a series of key equals value, ampersand, key equals value, ampersand, key equals value properties. So rather than just hard code them in, I'm taking the opportunity to show you how you can assemble something like this. Params here is a map. Now, if you've used Java at all, then you know you'd have to instantiate a map, probably a hash map or maybe a, a, a different one that you might want to use. And then you'd have to call the put method to put in all the keys and the values and plug them all in. Well, in Groovy, I can just write out my map. So I just wrote out these CHT, CHS, CHD, CHL. Those are all the keys that'll be in the map. And then here are all the values. And those are the same ones from the Hello World example that I just showed on the previous slide with the uh, URL. Once I have the map, I'm going to now assemble my query one moment because that's coming in the next slide. So for this slide, I want to say def means we have a variable that has not yet been declared to have a particular type. Uh, double quoted strings I'll talk about in a moment are used for parameter re replacement. So breaking this down a little bit more, there's the map. Okay, there's params, and it's a map of uh, keys and values. If you actually ask Groovy, you know, if I did a regular Java uh, get class dot get name, it would tell us that this is an instance of linked hash map. So this is one thing I want to mention. First of all, how easy it is to do collections in Groovy as opposed to Java. But secondly, how Groovy does not reinvent the wheel, or I like to call that reinvent the flat tire, which is what happens when you reinvent the wheel and you get it wrong. Uh, it uses the Java library. So if the Java libraries are available, it takes advantage of them. There's no need to re-implement everything in Groovy. This is one of the best features of Groovy, is that if you have an existing Java library or an existing infrastructure or any code you've already written in Java, then you can use that without any changes whatsoever, and you can add Groovy to that in a different class, and then in your Groovy class, you can use Java classes right inside the source code without any problem at all. So this, simply writing this statement, instantiates a linked hash map and puts in all the values there. Keys and values are separated by colons, and the entries are separated by commas. Uh, 